Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our study of putting uh, Gideon on a line, and let's begin with the word of prayer. <clears throat> Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we're very thankful to be here this morning studying together. And um, we invite your presence into our hearts and into our lives, into our study. We need you every moment. And we know that there are many uh, difficulties that we face. We pray for those that are grieving. Um, Sister Leona and also um, Brother Toby. And uh, we know, Lord, that you are always there to comfort us in times of sorrow and to strengthen us in times of weakness. So we just ask that you can help each of us as we go through this day, but especially, Lord, as we look at these studies and handle your word, we need your spirit to direct and, and instruct us. Be with us now, we pray and ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. So good morning. Um, I had, um, I'll share this screen here. So this is just um, putting some of these dates down upon a line, some of these verses. <clears throat> now, what we have here is we had in going through Judges chapter six, we have this this prophet, the message that this prophet has. So we're kind of looking at the judges as a timeline. There's a period of darkness. Uh, there's a time of the end. Uh, a prophet has given this message and he refers back, uh, um, uh, that is Gideon does, uh, to the deliverance from Egypt, which we looked at that April 26th date, but I didn't put that on here. And then we have, um, Judges 611, which we tied to September 11th, but also to November 9th, 2019. That is, we're taking September 11th and we're, we're mixing it with November 9th. And hopefully that's clear to people of why we did that. We spent a lot of time on it. And then there's this preparation of this offering. And we had taken Judges 6, verse 20 and 21 where this offering is accepted, it's given and accepted as a parallel to June 20th and 20, oh, I put, should be June 21st. I, I did this wrong anyway. Uh, I did put the wrong verses. Uh, so that's Judges uh, 6, 21 and 22. I don't know why I put, put that wrong, so I'll just correct that. 21, 22. This is 21 and 22. <clears throat> there we go. That's correct now. And then we had Judges 627, and we lined this up with June 27th, 2020. And June 27th, 2020 was uh, 1260 days from uh, January um, <clears throat> 14th, 2017. So, you know, I probably should note that there. <clears throat> and it's 21 days before July 18th. And then I'm marking July 18th with Judges verse 34 and 6 verse 34. And that's where the spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon and he blew a trumpet and Abiezer was gathered after him. And in 35 as well. And he sent messengers throughout all Manasseh who also gathered after him. And he sent messengers unto Asher and unto Zebulun, unto Naphtali, and they came up to meet him. And the significance there had to do with Asher, Zebulun, and Naphtali is that we studied that in connection with the numbering of the tribes of Israel. And we have very specific uh, spans of time for those um, uh, tribes. <clears throat> right. And then what we have and what we looked at for the last couple of days was the sign of the fleece. And <clears throat> I'm suggesting that fleece one 
is the understanding of the um, uh, or the, the examination of the foundation. Uh, yep, judges. So judges seven eighteen is also. So I was gonna we're we're gonna discuss that as well. How judges seven eighteen refers to July eighteen, but we'll come back to that around. So um, so we have the fleeces here, and I put them in as December 26th. Also, that's going to be the, the study that we're presently on, the understanding of the lines. And we started the study on March 7th, 2021, which was examining the foundation. And that study uh, continued for 187 studies. So we did 187 studies on examining the foundation. March 7th is a symbol of the Sunday law in 321. So that's going to be 1700 years after um, the Sunday law of um, Constantine. So, so we're going to examine this. So we put them on the line here. And hopefully we get a bit more discussion. And I know people have saying that they're thinking about this, they're watching it, they're trying to understand it. <clears throat> Uh, and, and if we go back to, uh, uh, um, so here we have uh, Gideon's 300 men, right? So what we're saying about Judges chapter 7, which also refers to uh, the blowing of the trumpets, right? So I think that's what Iran was talking about, right? And we're going to take that uh, this story repeats and enlarges um, the story of Judges 6. So you're going to have the trumpets again with July 18. Okay, any thoughts on this? So this is just putting what we had on this line from the last two days. The last few days. So um, Iran is noting that Judges 634 <coughs> combined, that is, that's the gematria, if you do the forward gematria and the reverse gematria, you get the number two, what was it again? Two, one, eight, seven. So that's uh, the symbols of July 18, 2020, those numbers in there. Oh, what's the gematria of which? Of the verse that we're marking as July 18, Judges 34, okay. 634. So if we look at that verse itself, that's the gematria, 2187. Okay, A any thoughts on this? I mean, you have time to think about it. <clears throat> so we have some of these verses symbolizing uh, major waymarks uh, as the symbols of the names of the verse itself. And even Judges 611 um, can be a mirror for 911 if it's done, if it's like flipped around the other way. Um, but we have it representing both 911 and 119. Right? So it depends if you flip it around. However, you take that 611, it can create that, that symbol. Okay, now as you've been asking, mm -hmm. when you put the line up, where where do we place the two visitations? that came to Gideon prior to the fleece? Um, okay, so, so what we have is we have, um, so let's go back. So here, what, what you're trying to say is you want the, the two visitations placed in there. I'm, I'm asking the question, I don't, I'm not saying anything. I'm asking a question. We have two visitations. One where Christ makes it clear to Gideon that something is seen in him that can defeat the, the Midianites, even if it's just Gideon himself. Okay, so that's which verse? Just a moment. Yes. I mean, I have the angel of the Lord came to Gideon in 611. I would, I believe that's correct. Yeah. Okay. 
and then you have a second time? Right. Yeah, because, well, we have 611, 612, because in 612, and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Yeah, but that's just the same time. This is just this is just how they write it in Hebrew. So it, it's telling an angel Lord came, um, and then it just says the angel Lord appeared unto him. So it's just the same time. It's not two different times. No, that's that is the first time. Okay, that's the first time. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's the first time described in okay. those verses. Yeah. Okay. Now, <clears throat> as we as we look a little further. If we come down to Judges 6.23. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Now, if we take this according to the spirit of prophecy, from Signs of the Times, 23rd of June of 1881, Mrs. White states, Then the Lord graciously appeared to Gideon a second time and said, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Okay, so that's the second time. And it's June 23rd, 1881. Yeah, and June 23rd is symbolized by 623. And that's in the signs of the times. Yes. So does that have relevance to what we're studying here? Well, yes. Um, so what, what I'm arguing here in this line, so if you look at the line, we have this doubling, right? That is, I take September 11th and November 9th as a double, right? Okay. So that's how I would line that up. So you would put both visitations basically to, to one point. Well, well, this is two points. This is September 11th and November 9th. But we're also putting this in June 23rd. Right? So can we connect June 23rd to November 9th as well? I, mean, I hadn't looked at it in that way. Because this is, you know, this is a period of time here. So I don't know. I, I, and I'd have to think about it. But June 23rd, um, this is going to be right after June 22nd. So I had marked this as this is this test of the offering, right? Okay. So the offering is given and we have this confirmation that God is with us. But then we're going to, you're going to say, Ellen White says in verse 23, we now have, um, and, and the fact that she writes this on June 23rd. Um, the fact that it's published on June 23rd. Published, yeah, published on June 23rd um, would be significant, right? That we'd have to take that as significant based on I how. I disagree. So, right. so now with June 23rd, I mean, this is part of later on, this becomes part of the separation. So we're taking the line of Gideon here, but the line of Gideon, we can line up when we go through chapter seven as well, right? So chapter seven is going to tell us the same story, just in a different way. Right. So, so here we have uh, June 23rd. It happens after June 22nd. <coughs> Um, so I'm not sure particularly what that means, except that we know that these become periods of separation in the movement, right? Well, yes, they become periods of separation in the movement because as this same article continues, mm -hmm. It states that the family to which Gideon belonged was grievously infected with idolatry. The last sentence of that of this paragraph that I'm looking at 
states that Gideon faithfully carried out these directions, and the directions were to tear down the altar to Baal, cut down the groves, and erect an altar to Jehovah. So, which which uh, paragraph is that? That's uh, Signs of the Times, twenty third of June, eighteen eighty one, paragraph twenty one, the midnight paragraph. Okay. Okay. And it be it, this this is the one that says the family to which Gideon belonged. So it's right there in the middle of the page right now. Yeah. So. As you read it, the family to which Gideon belonged was grievously infected with idolatry. Do we apply that with the movement in these separations? Mm -hmm. Because you're not going to be able to give a warning message if you're warning about something that you're holding on to in your own life. Mm -hmm. His father erected at Ophrah where he dwelt a large altar to Baal. So Gideon's father had erected this altar. Yeah. At which the people of the towns worshiped. Gideon was commanded to destroy this altar, to cut down the groves that surrounded it. And in its stead, erect an altar to Jehovah over the rock on which the offering had been consumed and then offer a sacrifice unto the Lord. Right. So, all of this, the tearing down of the altar, such as, you know, the separation from Tess and Parminder. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be earlier. Because in the story of Gideon, it's just the transition occurs in that separation. Okay. Then is the tearing down of this altar a further separation within the movement. Yeah. So, so the way that I understand this is that what we had, ap- so, so even when we go back, because I don't have on my line, I don't have September 7th and so forth, but it's part <laughs> of that, that change that happens with the previous judge. So on November 9th, we're going to have a message that would be marking Um, uh, that separation that would parallel September 11th, but that's something within the movement. So the movement, many in the movement are opposed to time setting, right? They're telling Jeff, don't listen to Theodore. We don't want to have anything to do with time setting. We don't want to have anything to do with any dates, right? Um, But see, the the problem, and this, this is what I've seen, it's yeah. not just that they want nothing to do with any dates. They want nothing to do with any chronology. Yes. Right. Well, dates are chronology, right? I, it's not just the future ones. It's even the past ones, any of the symbols. Or the current ones. Right. That, that we were totally misled in using numerology. Okay. I'm not, I'm not placing it as numerology. I'm placing it as chronology. Now, I know. But they call it numerology. To them, the, the use. They're twisting. The symbolic use of numbers is numerology to them, right? Fine. That we should never have have done that. And of course, and that's the one of the arguments that people kept telling me, the people that I was talking to. And I would just keep showing them again and again how numbers are used in scripture that we already accept. We accept 666. Uh, we accept 888. You know, we accept... Um, the number 12, you know, and all the different symbols of the number seven. And, you know, at what point do we decide that, well, these numbers that are in scripture that are given to us, that give us all these symbols, um, where do we reject them, right? And even people like um, Larry Lesher, I mean, who really liked what happened with the story of Ezra and the structure of the chiasms, I came, came to reject that completely. But he said, no, that was wrong. We can't do that. We can't use those symbols. We can't tie that to Millerite history. We can't take the first day of the first month as a symbol and put it in, you know, Millerite history because it occurred in the story of Ezra. We can't take, you know, we can't take any of that. So they've continued um, 
to, to reject what we were doing with numbers, right? So we have that happening, you know, at, on November 9th. There's a whole group of people um, that are not happy with any of what we're doing with chronology, with numbers. Now, when we get to, um, that's November 9th, 2019. So when we get to the publication of the paper, I mean, there's more happening behind the scenes than I know, because as I told you before, just even getting that web page prepared, uh, there was this strong resistance to anything that I had to say regarding July 18. Right. So they weren't interested in having me present or anything. Originally, I was supposed to be the one getting the web website prepared, like all the text for it. I had done it for, for weeks, um, spending lots, lots and lots of hours, and they took nothing that I did. And, and mostly mine was editing and getting it set up so that we had good references. When they did it, they had no references. They didn't want any references on their website. And I'm not sure why. Um, so they didn't want it to be directed to anybody else's web page, any like Wikipedia or anything like that. Right, no links, no external links. And then, um, so when this publication happened, there was a large group and I don't know how many, but they were quite embarrassed about what happened. So instead of looking at this as a miracle, uh, they saw this as an embarrassment. So, well, I mean, quite honestly, this is very much like the altar had been cut down. Yes, that's that's what I I would see. It would parallel uh, that now now what's going to happen is this altar is going to be cut down. If we want to put it that way. Well, and, the altar to Baal had been cut down. An altar to God had been erected in its place, and those of the city sought to destroy Gideon. Right. Now, part of this is, of course, people in the church have noticed us. But it's people in the movement that really didn't like what happened. They felt that, the, that it was all done wrong. Um, you know, that we were now being uh, compared, I guess, to, um, you know, to some kind of fanatical group or whatever that we, we somehow were like um, uh, anti-Islamic, right? Um, so to them, people just tried to distance themselves from what was happening with July 18th. So you had some people who were strengthened by that and some people who weren't, right? So, right. so the publication in the Tennessee became a bit of a dividing line. Now, the other thing is this tearing down of the altar is going to proceed. Now, I've marked June 27th as a particular way mark. Now, June 27 is 627. And it's also 276, right? So it's the number of people on the boat uh, in Acts 27. It's 627 BC. And 627 BC is going to be uh, from where the 40 days or 40 years of Ezekiel 4 verse 6 are counted, right? So he lies on his right side for 40 days. That's for the house of Judah. And of course, um, we have Judges 627 that I mark with that um, way mark. And it's also going to be the beginning of 21 days before July 18th. And it's 1260 days after um, the, the pandemic, right? So you're gonna have the pandemic and, and then it's 273 days before March, 27th, 2021, which is connected to December uh, 25th, 2021, by 273 days. So, so the 263 uh, or the 267, uh, the, seven, uh, the, the 627 and the 276 
are tied to Acts 27, which is tied to March 27. So we have all these different ties. And, and then we have, of course, July 18th, which we're marking with this blowing of the trumpet in Judges 634. All right, so, um, so he blew the trumpet there, and we also have, have, have that in Judges 718. So that's why we're marking the trumpet at July 18th. And of course, it is the trumpets um, that is going to lead us to this, right? Revelation 8 and 9, specifically Revelation 9. It's going to give us this date of July 18. So, I mean, there's just so many connections. Okay. So, following further with what, with what Mrs. White had said. Yeah. In the paragraph of reunion, paragraph 22. The deliverer of Israel must declare war upon idolatry before he went to battle with the enemies of his people. So in this same situation, the war is being declared on those that are more willing to accept the wisdom of man over the wisdom of God. Yeah. So those that are saying we want no chronology. Mm -hmm. are also in a very specific way setting aside we want no prophecy. Mm -hmm. So at this, at this point, as we go through here, Gideon has had to destroy the altar of Baal. Yeah, he had to eliminate the groves that surround it, so that the only thing that remains is the altar to the Lord over the rock where the sacrifice was accepted. Mm -hmm. and, and that and that's June twenty second, where we're really going to see that. And June twenty second is a symbol of FFA, right? And I'm using June twenty second in this structure where I'm saying that we have these four periods of 777 days. The center of that structure is June 22nd, 2017. And it's connected to the June 22nds that Jeff had marked. And the beginning of that structure, December 21st, uh, 2012, is between those two dates, exactly between those two dates that Jeff had chosen. Right. So, so we have all of this with June 22nd. But we now have June 23rd, the day after June 22nd, where Ellen White is, is giving us this story. And, and we're noting these, these paragraph numbers, 21, 22. And, and now we even have 23, which could right. tie us to this as well. See, I've, <clears throat> June 22nd always has stood out for me only because it's my grandmother's birthday. Okay. So in this situation, whenever something like this comes up, I'm paying attention. Mm -hmm. Now, what we're talking about here for paragraph 23, the offering of sacrifice unto the Lord had been committed to the priests and the Levites and had been restricted to the altar of Shiloh. But he who had established the Jewish economy and to whom all of its services pointed, had power to change the requirements. In this instance, he saw fit to depart from the ritual appointment. It was of great importance that the deliver, deliverance of Israel should be preceded by a solemn protest against the worship of Baal and an acknowledgement of Jehovah as the only true and living God. Now, our situation that we came to on July 18th mm -hmm. was that we began to understand more fully that we could not have reliance upon the wisdom of man. Mm -hmm. That our reliance, our soul and total reliance was to be upon God. And that meant that we were going to have to examine the structures 
examine the chronology just as Father Miller had done. And that if we were choosing that numbers and chronology were to be ignored, then we were choosing to set aside anything having to do with Father Miller. Yeah, well, and also the time setting of the Millerites. Right. Okay, that still you have to do. reject that completely. Like you, still, couldn't just, you couldn't just get rid of of any of the numbers and somehow, you know, keep October twenty second, eighteen forty four, as people right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I mean, that's what's that's what we see in this line. So this line, when we go to chapter six. I mean, we can definitely line it up with this history. And, and then we dealt with the fleece. So uh, just to finish that off, I mean, I asked people their understanding of that. But to me, the fleece would represent these, um, these studies, right? The first one was the examination of the foundation. And the second is the one that we're presently in. And these, these studies um, are, are extremely important in their, their symbols, right? So the first one, which goes for 187 studies, and then it's followed by 20, 25, 20 study briefly. And then, and then on December 26th, we then enter into this study. And, and this study is, um, I'm not sure when it will end, but it's, it's, it's going to go through the time of 2023 where this line ends. You know, the line of judges from 9-11 to 2023. And there are those that are going to receive the Holy Spirit and those that are not. Right. So, again, this this line of Gideon in chapter six is about a separation of two classes. So it is the everlasting gospel. I don't see that there's anything to disagree about. Yeah. Okay. So then we started on Judges chapter seven. So, so we said that Judges chapter seven is going to repeat that, that we saw in the line there. And that is, it's a repeat and enlarge. <clears throat> okay. All right, so we started, we started looking at this again, because we looked at it before. <clears throat> before I before I went to, to, to chapter seven, I looked at something in Judges six just briefly. I looked at the word of where Gideon was seeking to place the fleece, placing it on the quote floor. And if I understood the Hebrew right, looking that up, he's placing it on something that could be equivalent almost to the threshing floor. Yeah, it's the threshing floor. Yeah. Isn't that a fairly open spot? Yeah, well, it's it's a smooth place. It's it's uh, yeah, it's an open spot. So, isn't that the same as the message being openly addressed? I don't know. I don't know if I could. It seems too subjective. I mean, the the whole thing there is it's. He's going to do, he's going to thresh this in at the place. It's the wine press, right? So he's not actually in a proper place where he would thresh grain, right? Well, that's where he had been threshing was at the wine press. Agreed. Yeah. yeah. So he's going to thresh at the wine press, not at, at a thresh, a proper threshing floor, but he's going to put this fleece out and, and the word that's used there where, where the ground is, is involved, that's going to be Eretz, right? So that's referring to the land of Israel, 
often, right? It's just the general word, but as a symbol there, um, it's 776, the Hebrew number. And so when, when we looked at that, here, I'll just go back here. Right. So when you looked at this, the 776, which is what, how that chapter is going to end, we know that 776 is one short of 777. Right. Okay. So I, I think it's connected. And that is if you count from uh, November 9th, 1989 to December 25th, um, 1991, it's actually 776 days. So 777 and 776 are tied together. And, and the argument that had to do with, that Jeff was doing, had to do with um, what did the land represent, right? The glorious land, right? And he, he said that that's not the church, that's not Jerusalem, it's not the Jews, it's referring to the United States. So, so that's, that, there's, this plays a part in understanding of this test. So the ground doesn't receive the Holy Spirit in the first testing of the fleece, but in the second testing, it does. So that's the, the proclamation of the message. That's the uh, referring to the message um, going to those that aren't, that have rejected. So one group accepts the Holy Spirit, one group rejects it. But when the other group rejects the Holy Spirit. The gospel is going to be spread. That's the way that I understand the symbol. So I, I don't make much about the floor, the word floor being used, other than that it's a symbol of a smooth place. So he's going to lay it out upon a floor. Um, that to me would be... Um, the main the main symbol that's used there so that's 1637 it's an open area by analogy so it's a threshing floor or smooth the word means smooth so this has to do with 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 where he lays this out is where he had been threshing grain okay <clears throat> So we've laid it out into the open is what you're trying to say. That's what I'm getting at. Yeah, which, which I would agree. So, so this message is, is laid out, right? This, this test is not something that's hidden in a corner. I guess that's what you're trying to say. There you go. Okay. Yeah, so I'd agree there. So... Once it's laid out, it's there for any to see because it's on a smooth, flat place. It's not something that's difficult. It's something that is placed where anyone that wishes to examine it can examine it and decide for themselves. Yeah. That sets the table, that sets the tone for everything that we're about to go into with Judges 7. Okay. Because if everything is out in the open, if everything is now no longer hidden, then we now have a, a message that it becomes easier for people to say either, yes, I accept it, or no, I reject it. Mm -hmm. and, and definitely we've laid everything out as plain as possible. So, so now when we go to Judges 7, though, we're going to have a repeat and enlarge. Okay. Right. Because we're marking, for instance... Judges 718 as July 18. Right. So, so when we go to those lines, we can take Judges 7 and we can lay it over top of Judges 6.
Okay. Now, uh, so, and, and the fact that we have judges six and judges seven uh, together in this way, um, remember six plus seven is 13. It's a symbol of rebellion, right? Right. Um, so, you know, part of this is it's illustrating the rebellion that happens in this movement. Okay. And, and it's, it's meant to, to help us. It's not really to point out, you know, some people are in rebellion and some people aren't. If we were to take this study and go through it, if people were to take the time, we should be able to see how the Lord has been leading us and that this message of July 18th that has been given to us is not a false message. It has a purpose. We don't fully understand everything about it, but, but we know that it's, it's given us from God. We don't know how it's all going to work out. But we have to trust that since it's true and it's from God, but its purposes will be seen eventually. So when we start looking at Judges 7, then um, we have Gideon now. And now we know that he is he was changed his name or his name, Jerobeal. Uh, was given him in the previous, at the end of the previous chapter, dealing with the tearing down of the altar. So he now has two names, right? Okay. So what does that mean? Well, we have, we have two names, but is this, is this technically a name change? Well, it's a name change in chapter six. Okay. But now we have the two names mentioned at the beginning of chapter seven. Okay. So why is that? Because you have this transition from chapter six to chapter seven with this name change, right? Because that's, um, so if we go back here, where is it? Uh, it's going to be... In, in 632, therefore on that day, he called him Jerubbaal, saying that Baal plead against him because he had thrown down his altar. So his name change is connected to the throwing down of the altar. So now if we look at Judges 7, which is a symbol of perfection or completeness, we see that we have this, this name change being mentioned right at the beginning. So what does that mean? We know it's a name change. Okay. Been previously, but it's going to be mentioned because we're starting a new line again. We're going to, it's a repeat and enlarge. So why did, where do we place this Joe Bale, who is Gideon? Because this is, what was a name change normally marking? Covenant relationship. Okay. And so where would we put this covenant relationship if we're going to draw it on a line? What way mark? But is this a covenant relationship? Is he going into covenant with Baal? No, this is a covenant with God. But this, this name is given him at this point, right? So it's still a name change. Even though it's, you know, even though it has Baal in it. Where would we normally put this covenant relationship? Where is the covenant relationship? Where does the name change go on a way mark? I hadn't considered this in that manner. Okay. Well, we've had name changes before. Right. Where, but, did, where, where did we place them? But those name changes, like that of Jacob to Israel, mm -hmm. or Abram to Abraham, were given as a name change between the party and God. Yeah, but not every name changes. We, we've noted lots of name changes that have nothing to do with the, between the party and God. I, you know, I recognize, you know, like Daniel, 
was given a different name. So mm-hmm. were his friends. Yeah. But these were to give symbols to the pagan gods. Right. I understand. And same with Jeroboam. But this is because Gideon is conquering Baal. Right. I understand. I, I'm understanding your point about him conquering Baal. I'm just, I'm having to wrestle with the point of this being a, a name change, to show a closer relationship with God. Well, uh, the point is, it's a name change that is a waymark. Where do we place name changes as waymarks? After significant events. Okay, well, what significant events? Well, I mean, they're not just, name changes just aren't sprinkled willy-nilly throughout reform lines. I would say that the name change of Jacob to Israel occurred after his vision of the ladder between earth and heaven. Mm -hmm. Abram after his vision of the sacrifice where he walked between the the smoking sacrifices Um, okay let me see here so how do we place those on a line Yeah, he's going to be called Abraham uh, when at the circumcision, the covenant of the circumcision. But wasn't he called Abraham about Genesis 15? No, it's Genesis 17. Okay. All right. He's still, so he's still called Abram in Genesis 15, but it's in Genesis 17 that we first get the name Abraham. Okay. That's written in 17, verse 5. Neither shalt thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For of a father of many nations have I made thee. I mean, so the question that, that I have still is do we have a place where we put a name change? I'm trying to figure out how to give you a direct answer. I would say that, yes, there is, but I can't say exactly how. Stephen, do you have any insight on name changes? Well, considering Jacob, it was, uh, that occurred when an angel came down. Okay. Namely Christ. Mm-hmm. So we, we would mark 9-11, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's kind of the point that I I wanted to get at is that this this is representing nine eleven. So, if we're going to take Judges uh, chapter seven, verse one, would we mark it here where Judges six eleven is? Now and we're tying September eleventh to November 9th, so. So would we put put this at the same place? I mean, the name change occurs in the other chapter. But in chapter 7 now, the name change is being emphasized right on the first verse. Okay, so you you made a logical point. Yeah. So so that that's so I mean that's my argument. It, I I think it's pretty clear. That if we're going to take this line, then we're going to we're going to uh, line it up. Uh, oh, I have this. Okay, that's the center. Never mind. Um, we're going to find that this is going to repeat the same history. That that's why I'm I'm emphasizing this name change in Judges chapter seven, verse one. That where it's it's noted that he had his name changed. So obviously changes in chapter six. 
Okay, so what you're saying then is that the name change arrives in chapter six, but is formalized in chapter seven. Well, yes. I mean, I mean, and it has a role in chapter six in the lines, but it's here in chapter seven because we're laying chapter seven over, over top of chapter six. And so it's going to bring us back to the same way, Mark, to November 9th, 2019, that we're going to have then this separation occur, right? Because that's what chapter seven is dealing with. It's it's the uh, the refining of this message. It's uh, you know we've we, looked at it as the the whittling down of the the numbers within the movement, but it's really specific. We're taking the story of Gideon specifically applying it to this whole line of the judges because we're saying that the judges illustrate the history of this message from night from september 11th all the way to um 2023 and november 9th illustrates september 11th so even when we're going back to november 9th with the story of gideon uh we are still in a sense illustrating that whole history because 9 11 to 11 9 is Okay, when so, way mark becomes the same way mark. With with what you're what you're saying here, and the way that I'm being led to ask the question: If Judges six is the arrival, and Judges seven being the formalization. Are we looking at Judges 6 and 7 as another type of first angel, second angel message in line with that that occurred with the Millerites? I don't know how we could do that. I mean, I, I, I look at Judges 6 and 7 as parallel, so they're not, um, I mean, you could say that the first angel parallels the second angel. But we've actually placed specific dates for Judges 6. And Judges 7 is going to cover those same dates, or at least some of them. But it's, illu them, yes. it's illustrating something different than Judges 6 is. Agreed, but that's also the situation that we have with the first and the second angel's message. Yeah, I understand. Because when we got into this, and we looked over the Millerite time frame. Mm -hmm. By the time the second angel's message had arrived, you had a major separation that had already been going on. And further separations occurred. Yeah. So I, I, you know, obviously the first angel illustrates the second angel. It's just here, this movement is the second angel's message. It's not the first angel's message. So the first angel is, I mean, you can always create these parallels between them. But very specifically, this movement was typified by Samuel Snow, who's all about the second angel's message. And Ezekiel, who's all about the second angel's message. And so this is all about the second angel's message. So even though the thir first angel can illustrate that, um, I wouldn't look at this as, you know, the first and second angel's message. Now, we could look at a formalization and a power em uh, empowerment of the second angel's message that chapter six more illustrates the formalization of the message itself. And chapter seven illustrates more the empowerment of that message. And that's the way that I would understand six and seven. Because we see that in chapter six, it's more about the message itself. Even though there are parts in which, because it's a line, it has empowerment. But chapter seven is more about the Sunday law, which is an empowerment of the second angel's message. It's also the empowerment of the third angel's message, by the way, but, but they're tied together. 
Okay. But I'm just, uh, all I'm trying to get at with this is that I'm seeing a formalized situation with the name change. So I'm using that same structure of arrival, formalization, and then empowerment. Okay, I don't follow then how you, what you're saying. Okay. We're saying that the name change occurs in Judges 6, but is not openly addressed until Judges 7. So it arrives in Judges 6. It is formalized, openly addressed in Judges 7. And then his empowerment becomes this where he then understands that he is to be the defeater of Baal. He is the one that's to, to be the anti-Baal that is to stand for God. Okay, so, so you're going to say that 6, 7, and 8 just represent the, the arrival, the formalization, and the empowerment. Well, just like the, the arrival began to, had occurred within six, but was not formalized until seven, I would have to say yes, with, with eight being the, the, for, the empowerment, yes. So you're just, so you're not saying that this is the first, second, and third angel's message, you're saying this is the formalization, the arrival formalization empowerment. Right. Okay. Um, I'd have to think about that one. I, I don't know if I could do that with these lines, how we're doing it, because we're taking them all as a complete line. We're not taking Judges 6 and saying, I mean, that it's the arrival of the message. We're not taking Judges 7 to saying that that's the formalization of a message. And Judges 8, that that's the empowerment, empowerment of the message. At least we haven't. Um, because they're all covering the same history. Well... Here again, when we start with Judges 7, 1, the verse reads, then Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well, the well of Herod, or Harad, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. Mm -hmm. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, mine own hand hath saved me. Is this not a test? And was not the formalization of the message of the first and the second angel also a test during the Millerite time frame? Yeah, except that's not what's being illustrated here. What's being illustrated is 9-11. So 9-11 is just as much a test for those still within the corporate church and those that are beginning to really become part of the movement. Yeah, I don't understand what you're saying. I, I don't understand how the formalization... Uh, has anything to do with what you what how we're putting this line out this is just all i'm looking at is we have this name change that's mentioned again and that's going to bring us back to november 9th 2019 and so that's starting a line again the same line we already did in judges six so i, I don't know what you're saying it doesn't make any sense to me okay that's, that's all I'm saying. I'm sorry about that. I, I don't, 
I'd say I wouldn't even use the word formalization and arrival uh, dealing with this name change because they're, they're two different lines. They're not, like two different descriptions of the same line. And, and they occur in different places, but it's here in Judges 7 verse 1 that we have this name change that is going to tie us to September 11th or November 9th. And it just gives us a starting point so that when we go through Judges chapter 7, we can see it's going to be illustrating the same history that was already illustrated. Now, the name change comes as a result of, um, in, in chapter 6, because of the tearing down of the altar. Right? I'm listening. Okay. So, so now when we, when we look at it in, in Judges 7, it's showing us the character of who Gideon is. And we already have acknowledged that November 9th is, is about basically addressing the problems that we had with this idolatry that existed within this movement. So chapter six is going to address that. Chapter seven now is going to address the same history, but in a different way. Right, because this isn't now about the removal of idolatry in chapter seven. This is about a refinement of the message and, and also about the separation that occurs because of the message. And this is going to be the history from November 9th to 2023. So, you know, what I didn't put on the line uh, here is, you know, I, I just ended with this December 26th date, right? But actually, this whole line uh, of chapter six does lead us to 2023. So, so we'll, we'll see that, but I, I left it out for now because we'll see this more clearly in chapter seven. Is that helpful at all? I mean. Because maybe I don't fully understand what you're trying to say, but it doesn't doesn't seem to fit what I'm what I've been seeing. I think we may be coming at the same point from a couple of different perspectives, but we're trying to say the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't see the judges six, seven, and eight represent the arrival, formalization, and empowerment of the message. Not in the way that we're making this application to this movement, because they're all I mean, you could say that every time you zoom into a waymark, you have another line. So, I mean, we could say that and maybe that that's correct. But I, I don't know if I would take the naming of uh, Gideon as Jeroboam as a point that would illustrate that. Um, so, but, you know, it may just be, you know, I don't, I'm not seeing what you're saying. Because we've already gone through this, right? So we've already gone through these chapters and we already sort of identified what these things are. We're just, we're just making it more clear. We're giving us specific dates for things that we already saw. So I would say, you know, what we're trying to do here is we're taking this story of Gideon in chapter seven and we're saying, well, we can start this at November 9th because of the name change. Even though the name doesn't change here, it's a different line, it's a different story. So that name change is being marked here, so it must be marking 9-11 in the context in which we're looking at this line. Right, and then we're gonna have this separation. So with November 9th, like if we look at Judges 3, now therefore go proclaim in the ears of the people saying, 
Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people 22,000, and there remained 10,000. Now, we already looked at 10,000 and 22,000, so we know what these represent. But can we mark a separation that occurs in November 9th that would represent this separation? I have to think about that. Because November 9th, that's what we see happening. Isn't it what, what happens? Isn't that how we see it? That the majority leave, and we still have 10,000, but those are going to be whittled down to 300. Because that's the way Jeff applied it. And, and I don't see any reason to change that. Even though we're going to look at the message, it's about the message of Gideon, but still that we know that the numbers in this movement continue to diminish. But isn't that the same thing that we saw with the, when we examined the Millerite history? Yeah. Yeah. And so in Millerite history, we have the first separation on the first day of the first month, which represents 9-11, right? Okay. So, so... Now we're using November 9th because we're saying November 9th is parallel or illu is illustrated by 9-11. Correct. But we're more specific. So we can say that this is what happens in the movement on November 9th. 22,000 leave and there remains 10,000. But there's going to be this test which has to do with how we study God's word. Right? Correct. And, and that test is going to bring only 300 left. And those 300 are the ones who are going to give this message. Right? So the way that Jeff applied it, the 300 referred to those that gave the July 18th message. And we believe the July 18th message was connected to the Sunday law. It is... July 18th to December 25th, 2021, specifically, is the period of the Sunday law. And we looked at July 18th as the midnight cry. So, you know, it's like connecting um, August 15th, uh, 1844 to October 22nd. And that's but we understand a little bit more than Jeff did just because we've passed July 18th. But we can see that this still is is essentially correct. And this whittling down of the 300, in a sense, is still continuing. That is, the refinement of the message is still continuing. So the 300 is a symbol of those who accept the message of July 18, 2020. And who give a message to the Levites, because we said that the number 300 is the same as the number 273. Right, so they're going to be given this, this message to give, and we say that Judges 718 is July 18, 2020. Right? We're going to apply that as a symbol, yes. Right. And, and that, that, that means if we're going to take these events in Judges 7 and put them on a line and give dates to them, what we can do is we can give 7 verse 1, we can give that November 9th, 2019, and then this history that follows leads us up to July 18, 2020. Right, so that's that's how we applied it. Well, at least July 18, 2020, but I'm saying now we can go back because we can give specific dates. And then we say that these are divided into three camps, right? Three camps? Yeah, there's three, 300 
they're divided into 300 of uh, 100 in each with Gideon is you know 101 in another so there's three different groups okay companies right companies yes well companies and camps are basically just a different way of saying the word because the word camp comes from the word companies but anyway and and then we have the word companies um now here it's kind of interesting because it in this word that's translated as companies it's actually the word rosh so it it doesn't really even use the word companies three heads and the three heads blew the trumpets and break the pictures, pictures, right? Um, so I'm not sure why why they translated as companies, but I mean that's obviously the idea because we know that each of them have these lamps and and pictures and trumpets. Okay, so, so where would we, why, how do we understand the dividing of, of this into three different groups of 100 men each? How did we apply it before? Do we make any connection to the three days? That was one of the points we started to try to make, yes. Yeah. yeah. So we're saying that this, this represents the three days. So we had already understood a long time ago from July 18 to December 25th, 2021. We had, we had marked this as a period that would be equivalent to the three days. At least that's how we first looked at it. Right. So when we were doing the study on the three days and we came to uh, looking at um, the 20th day of the ninth month with the three days that are there, uh, we can we can take July 18th as representing this period of time in which this movement is tested. Are we going to come to Jerusalem to address the separation of of the strange wives, right? But then there's gonna be given a period of time. So they, they get three days to come to Jerusalem and then we're gonna have, um, they're gonna set up this, this um, court or whatever to do this judging, to deal with the civil uh, separation from these, um, from the, the, you know, these marriages, of these divorces, right? And it's going to begin on the first day of the 10th month and it's going to continue to the first day of the first month. So we've addressed that in, in a chronology. But I'm saying that these three, the number three being used here, um, would be a reference to that, to that symbol of the three days. So then when, when we, we deal with the actual blowing of the trumpets that occur, we're not placing that at July 18th. That this is something that happens after July 18th. Even though we have the blowing of the trumpet as an instruction, and we have the blowing of the trumpet in chapter six as marking July 18th. What's now being described when Gideon defeats Midian is something else that has to do with internal within the movement. Isn't that how we've understood this? And this is about a message to the Levites. This is something still future.
Any any thoughts about this? Or am I just plowing through with, you know, with my own thinking or people understanding where we're going with this? I'm trying to mentally set the three companies with the three days. I'm not disagreeing with you. It's just, this is a concept that I've got to struggle with. Okay. Um, Well, we know we have the number three and we already marked the three days um, in connection with July 18th because there's three days before the 20th day of the ninth month, right? And since that's December 25th, 2021, we marked the three days from July 18th to December 25th, 2021. Okay, so what was the third day of creation? Um, I don't know, something to do with uh, the land separating, I believe. But that's what it was, because you're going to have the, the the sky separated and uh, on the second day, and then the and then you're going to have the let the the earth and the seas separated, and the plants given on the third day. Okay. So that wouldn't apply in this situation. No. No, but but when we looked at three days, I mean, we saw this symbol. It was, uh, I mean, Christ, the the third day being resurrected. But mostly what we looked at the three days, as far as in a chronological relationship, we had the three days of the dreams of the butler and baker. We had, and, and, but more specifically, we had three periods of three days in the story of Ezra seven to 10. Right, the three days at the river Ahava, the three days after they get to Jerusalem until they give the gold and silver to the temple, and then the three days call to repentance in chapter 10. Right, so on the 20th day of the ninth month that they have to come. So, so that happens after three days, and so that's December 25th, 2021. So that's how we understood the the three days. And and I don't think, I don't see any reason to change that. Now we have three different companies as well. So you have 300, which represents the message to the Levites. That's how we've understood it because we can find that number. in those, the 300 that's not counted in numbers three. And Ellen White refers to the 276 on the ship from which we get the 273. She refers to it as 300. So we can, we can relate this message as the message to the Levites. But they're also divided into three groups, right? So you have the 300 itself, but they're divided into groups of hundreds. And why is that? What what would that be illustrating? Because we're talking about putting this on a line. And, and who's he going to be calling? Right, even in this in this whole story, he's going to call. This is this is northern Israel. Certain groups are called. Remember, um, there's going to be the issue dealing with Ephraim and so forth, and what happened. It comes up later. Yeah. I mean, it, it's addressed again at the end of chapter seven, but it comes up in full in chapter eight. Yeah. 
And, and we know that when they defeat this camp of the Midianites, that they're going to be joined by all the men of Israel, gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, out of Asher, out of all Manasseh, and pursued after the Midianites. So you're going to have this group of people that are going to join them. So even though the 300 go into the camp of the Midianites, of some of those that had been separated earlier, they're going to join them, right? Right. Okay. <clears throat> so the 300 must represent something about the message to the Levites. Now, are these ones that are called later, is this the message to the Levites? Are those the, the Adventists who join in the message? Those that get angry because they didn't see themselves as being, you know, called first, even though they were called. Well, that's going to be Ephraim. But as far as Naphtali, Asher, and all of those of Manasseh that join, then now Gideon's going to send messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, right? He's going to invite them, but they're going to later say, well, we weren't invited. Because they weren't invited initially in, in that group that came um, of the what? The 3,200, uh, 32,000, I mean, right? Okay. Because they're going to be divided. So you get the 22,000 and then there's 10,000 that remain. Right. And that word remain is a remnant, right? There's 10,000 in the remnant. We know that 10 is the symbol of the remnant. But um, I know we're ju I'm jumping around here, but I'm just trying to get through this. So then we're going to have... Um, all these people come and then they're going to follow. Um, they're going to capture these two princes, Oreb and Zeb, right? And then in chapter eight, you're going to have Zeba and Zalmuna, right? So these doublings, what would they represent? We've normally placed a doubling as being something representative of the second angel's message. But you've midnight, got some. Yeah, midnight in the midnight cry. Right. So this would have to be that. So if we're calling the, the Levites, aren't they called in connection with midnight in the midnight cry? Very possible. Yeah, that's, that's how we've understood it before. And so. What this is showing in chapter seven is that the message of July 18th is connected with the calling of the Levites. Because what, one, of the, one of the things that we've struggled with in this movement, um, you know, for a long time, when, when we started having July 18th and we started to especially after July 18th. Well, what is our message? And there was a large class that thought that July 18th is not our message, that we're not going to be presenting this to, to anybody. Um, and, and, and basically, there was a rejection of July 18th, you know, by some in that case. But even the ones that accepted it, uh, we see that within this movement, that it's not a prominent part of our message, right? All right. You know, it's, it's like you can say you accepted October 22nd, 1844, but you're predicting that Jesus is going to come back in, um, you know, November of 1851. So, you're only giving lip service to October 22nd, 1844, if you don't understand its purpose. So, so this message that we have had, everything that has happened in this movement is part of our message to the Levites.
it's a part of a message that we have to fully accept ourselves before we can give a message to the Levites. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a pretty difficult concept. You know, here we made a prediction that nothing happened on that, on what we expected. And yet we have to go to people and say, we were correct. Now, isn't that really what the Millerites had to do who accepted October 22nd, 1844? Yes. Right. Now, they had a rationale for why they accepted October 22nd, 1844. Nothing apparently happened. That is, nobody saw anything. You can't look at October 22nd and say, you know, Christ moved from the holy to the most holy place, except by understanding scripture. Right? Doesn't matter that Hiram Edson had a vision in the cornfield. That doesn't mean anything to anybody. Right. They didn't see anything. Nothing happened. That's the way the world looks at it. That's the way Christianity looks at it. It's the way many Adventists look at it. We were wrong. It's just the wrong date. Nothing happened. Same thing with July 18th. But the Millerites went forward with a message that something did happen in heaven. And we have a message that something happened as well. Right. This is something that happened within this movement. And some people would say, well, how does that relate? How is anybody going to care about our movement? That something, you know, that we had this date, July 18th. Well, the thing is, we can show all through the scriptures, all through, you know, this whole history, all through all the dates and all that, that has happened as a witness of what God has done. Now, this movement is not ready to present chronology to anyone you know, there might be some in the movement. Odilio definitely, you know, is looking at chronology in Colin. But the vast majority of the movement isn't interested in that. Right? They don't want to look at these dates. That's kind of a problem because you've got to be able to present chronology with the prophecy. Yeah. And even if you accepted the chronology of Colin and Odilio, and you say, well, you know, we like what they're saying because it fits in with our idea of the Sunday law and the pandemic and what's going to happen and how it's all going to unfold. But you're not interested in understanding the dates and, and the chronology that led us to that conclusion uh, about those dates that are being used. You're still going to have a big problem. Because when something doesn't happen, you can just throw it all away because you have no foundation upon which you have uh, built your prediction. You know, so so next Tuesday, you know, Colin's prediction is. Is coming up, you know, and of course, it's going to take a bit of time to see that Colin's prediction didn't come about as the way that he expected. And he expects what to occur basically on Tuesday. Well, for the, for the, um, the Republicans to have control of, of, of Congress and the Senate so that they can impeach Biden and Harris, that they can make Trump, um, the Speaker of the House, and thus as the Speaker of the House, he can become the President of the United States. So that Trump becomes the President of the United States in connection with these midterm elections. That was the prediction. Now, whether they're changing that or not, I don't know. But that, that was Colin's prediction. Whether everybody accepts that, I don't know. But I know some people do. It's kind of far-fetched. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's, you know, but people would say, well, well you know, it, it may look far fetched, but this is what's going to happen because we, we have this understanding of prophecy. And that in order for Jeff to have been correct, Trump has to become president, the next president. You can't have somebody else. Now, you know, he could have placed it and just said, well, in 2024, Trump's going to run and he's going to win. But that's not what Colin did. 
And even then that's still pretty far fetched. But also it's just ignoring everything that we learned, right? So I know we've gone over a few minutes here. So we're gonna have to come back to this. So you got a few days to think about it. Um, but I really need more help because, you know, and I know here Dwight and I, we, you know, he brings up something and I sort of dismiss it. But, you know, I, we're, we're all working on this together. And so this, these lines need to be a product of all of us working on them, not me just coming to my conclusions. But we had already gone through this. We had already agreed on many of these things. So, you know, we could review some of these videos before we come together again, you know, personally. Okay, any, any final thoughts? Something that we need to address before we close with prayer? Yes, more look at Each of us need to contemplate, study on. Okay. Same. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, again, we, we are amazed at what you do and how you work in our lives and how you have chosen us out of the world. And we look at ourselves and our insufficiencies and we marvel. But we know, Lord, that you are leading this movement and you have a purpose and a plan for it that we need to come to that upper room that self has to be crucified and set aside and that Christ has to live within. Help us to understand um, how all of these things relate to us presently. We pray for those in this movement who are not set upon a foundation. And we just pray, Lord, that um, they still can be saved that they will be able to follow the truth and that they can um, accept the failures that we all experience. Be with us uh, throughout this day until we meet again tomorrow evening to study. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>